it's a special Sunday morning, uh, if I could say that to you. And this is our four year anniversary of Pilgrim Baptist Church. And I'd like to take a little side trip this morning and, and talk to you about what makes a good New Testament local assembly. And I'll say this, the first Sunday in November uh, of 2018, we started Pilgrim Baptist Church. We, we held our first official church service uh, in the country in in suites on South Jefferson Ave. It was uh, one of the families from our sending church was here to support, and we had one church member besides our family, and that was that was Caroline Newton. We had that church service and that meeting place and that, and that hotel for one month before we realized that the general manager and the sales manager were on two different pay pages as far as giving us a consistent lease. So we ended up spending the next month at the Holiday Inn Express. So we went from one hotel to another hotel, and that was that was in December of 2018. That same month, of December of 2018, we were at the Putnam County Library to do some public evangelism because there was a drag queen story hour there. <laughs> and so, yeah, the kids. So we went to this drag queen story hour, and we met a man there that was impressed with the ministry that we were doing. And we got to talk in, and long story short, he offered us his conference room of his financial building that was uh, right over the Cokeville line off of 111 in Sparta. He offered us to use his conference room free of charge. And we met and we hit it off and we spent the next, well, we spent the, uh, that January of 2019, we spent the next 10 months at that place he said you're free to use this until it sells and but there was came a point where he had said to us that well uh, i've got someone that i think is pretty serious about buying i'm not to, just giving you y'all heads up and so at that point we thought it'd be good to look around and kind of cover our bases so we didn't end up without a place to meet so we did and long story short uh, i ended up meeting uh pastor ernie gall who pastored in this church house, in this building, the old Bible Baptist Church, which was built in the, in the 70s. I think the building was built before I was born. <laughs> and Brother Galt and I hit it off real good. And um, long story short, we uh, he allowed me to preach the first message here in this church house on the first Sunday in November <laughs> of 2019. It was one year. From when we started the first Sunday in November in 2018 to one year, we ended up here uh, being able to preach the first message here. And we never had one revival meeting. We never had one preacher in to do a two or three day revival camp. Not against any of that, but we just committed from the beginning to say what it's going to take to do a work of the Lord is commitment. And so I had, a, I had a house in Florida that I could have either kept and moved down here or I could have sold and burned every bridge I can burn to show this town and show these people that God would bring that we're committed. Matter of fact, we bought a piece of land. We didn't buy a house. We bought land. We didn't just buy land. We bought land that was overgrown with forest. <laughs> that means all the trees had to come down. The driveway had to be cut. The water had to be installed. The electric had to be uh, installed. The, the foundation had to be poured. And you know what you need to get something like that done? Commitment. You need a bit of a pioneer spirit. You need a little bit of, you know, a little you big couple of your screws loose, too. <laughs> My wife said I had it all. <laughs> but you know what that takes? It takes commitment. You know what it takes commitment in? The Lord. To see you through. Many people say, and I've often said to myself, I bit off more than I can chew. chew. And if you were to say that to me this morning, I'd probably agree with you. <laughs> I probably did bite off more than I can chew. But what it takes to get something done nowadays is commitment. And I'd like to speak to you this morning about commitment. And our long-term vision for Pilgrim Baptist Church has really come into short-term view. We prayed since we even came out here 50-50 we prayed 50-50. Lord, by the time I hit 50, would you send 50 committed people? 
Well, I'm going to be 50 in a couple of weeks, and we're almost at 50 committed people. On a Sunday morning in four years, that's not too bad. We're preaching the Word of God. So we're going to continue to pray for that. And look, I know it's not about numbers, but you need numbers to get something done for the Lord. And we pray we want to eventually, we want to start a Bible Institute. We want to, we want good news clubs going around this town. We want workers running, uh, running a van to bring kids that can't get to church to church. And we want, we want a thriving youth program where the young people learn about Jesus and, and can have opportunities to serve. We, we've got a vision for all of that. And you know what it takes? Commitment. It takes a little bit of pioneer spirit. And it can't be just one man trying to do it. It can't be one family trying to do it. It can't be two families trying to do it. It can't even be three families trying to do it. Although that's a great place to start, everyone can and should have an opportunity to serve. We're going to talk about commitment this morning. If you would, open your Bible to Luke chapter number 14. Luke chapter number 14. I understand people visit churches, and that's fine. We want, we want visitors. So if, if you are visiting this morning or if you're watching online visiting, this message really isn't for you. This is, uh, you, this is why they call it visiting, not committing. This is why you're a visitor, not a member. Um, but I'd like to speak to those that have been invested in Pilgrim Baptist for some time. I'd like to speak to you about commitment. I don't want us to become a church where our greatest commitment is warming our assigned seat in the pew that we've designated as ours. And I don't believe we have that spirit here. I don't believe we do, but that's not commitment. And that's not the style of commitment I'm speaking about. We don't need another great idea. What we need is another, we need commitment to a very simple idea. Commitment is what I like to speak to you about. In Luke chapter 14, verse number 12, the Bible says, Then said he also to him that bade him, Well, now make us the dinner or a supper. Call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, nor thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed. For they cannot recompense thee. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. That truth bothered those hearers and we're going to find out how in a minute you don't get any compensation from the poor <laughs> the maim the lame you don't and this truth that jesus spoke it bothered them watch well if you don't like truth and if you don't want to take advice or if the truth that's offered to you bothers you or if it reveals something about your character or my character, do you know what we do as human beings? Because we've all done it at some point in our life. We change the subject. And the easiest and most successful way to change the subject is how? You pull the humble break. You turn it into a spiritual excuse to give yourself an out. And that is what the response was in verse 15. Look at it. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. You know what he did? This response. He didn't say anything that was false. He said something, the response was 100% true. It couldn't be argued, but it was devoid of practical application for what Jesus was speaking about in that current time. So let's change the subject. It's a way to not commit to thinking about the things that Jesus wanted them to think about. So they said, well, instead of talking about earthly things right now, let's just talk about heavenly things, Lord. Let's just look into the future. After all, we're all going to be in the kingdom of God. <laughs> let's just change the subject. Well, Jesus was just talking to them about right now, what are we going to do? And you know what they did? Well, let's talk about the future. And so he's got to get them back on course. Watch. He said, then he said unto him, a certain man made a great supper 
and bade men. So Jesus has said, you know what? This thought process is going far enough. I'm going to turn the tide a bit. I'm going to get it back on course because this blessed is he talk. <laughs> He's going to point out to him. It's just all talk. No walk. And you know what commitment takes? Walk. Walk. You got to walk. it, And he's going to teach them something very important. The kingdom of God is not just something way out in the future. The kingdom of God and its blessedness, some of it can be realized right here, right now, in the present. And that's what he wants them to get a hold of. Enjoy the blessings now. You know why they couldn't enjoy the blessings now? And do you know why most Christians can't enjoy the blessings now? Because they're not committed. Their minds are off yonder in the future. And some of those things are true, but they just can't be present. They can't be present in the present. And they can't commit. And watch what he says. And he sent a servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come for all things are ready now. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. And the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. The servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. The Lord said unto the servant, Go out in the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be what? Phil, thank you for finishing that. You ever try to talk to somebody, a Christian, about spiritual things and current things living as a christian and they say to you something like well what really matters is that we're saved you know what that is that's what jesus is talking about you know what does really matter that someone is saved it's a true statement <laughs> of course we would agree with that but it is an evading statement when someone doesn't want to deal with the present they make a quick evade and they make a spiritual statement and place it out in the future. Yes, the most important thing that is that someone is saved. Are you saved? <laughs> Let's realize some of those blessings now and get in on some of those Christian living principles now rather than trying to put off committing to something that is also important. When you evade as a way of putting off talking about important matters, it's a form of self-deception. Families cannot do this. Businesses cannot do this. They must be able to talk about different things. They must be able to have the conversation rather than putting it off and acting like it isn't there. It's self-deception. And the Lord here is pull, pull, pulling out in this principle I want you to weigh out your words and test them to see if they are actually reality. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words shall thou be condemned. He wants them to take into account how are they living. I'm asking you the same thing that I'm asking myself this morning. How are we living? Are we committed to living for Christ? Are we committed to our local assembly that the Lord has placed us in? The Bible says, Jesus said, this people honoreth me with their lips. But what was far from them? Their heart. Can I say this? I am going to bank on the fact that none of the men in this room and none of the ladies and none of the children in this church house this morning, I'm going to bank on the fact that none of you use foul language to your boss, to your neighbor, to your husband, wife, to your kids, to your parents. 
I'm going to guess you do not use bad words and foul language. I can almost guarantee that'd be a good time to say, but I'm going to propose this thought. Sometimes it isn't our bad words. Sometimes it's our good words that can be more blasphemous to a holy God than are bad. We give the Lord lip service. We give our brothers and sisters lip service. And we're very good at being, and I'm myself included, I'm very good at looking out and say, well, we don't talk like the world. We can clean up. Our, our mouth isn't a potty mouth. We're quick to point out the potty mouths of everyone else. Yet sometimes our good words can be more blasphemous because we use them as an excuse to not be committed to the work of the Lord. Look at verse number 16. Then said he unto him, a certain man made a great supper. It's been an elaborate preparation that the Lord prepared. Yet men prefer other things. Men, prefer, women, men and women prefer other pursuits. Yet a great supper has been prepared that we can all sit down and enjoy. We didn't have to do anything to prepare. It's all been prepared for us. Salvation by grace. We've got other things that occupy our mind. We were having dinner on Friday night. My son and two of the workers, we had to work this weekend. And, uh, and we were up in Bowling Green and we went, we went out to eat and had a good meal. And as we're eating, sports are being talked about. And I don't, is there anything wrong with sports? No, nothing wrong with sports. Well, the conversation was getting more deep into sports. Well, I had to excuse myself, not because of sports, but because I had to use the bathroom. And when I got up from the table and I walked over to use the bathroom, I noticed there was an old man sitting there with his wife. He was wrapping up his meal. The check was on the table. But he had, he had a hat on that hat, he was a Vietnam vet, and it was a purple heart hat. So I went in, used the bathroom, I came back out, and I stopped, and I said to the man, thank you for your service to our country, and welcome home. Thank you, sir. His wife's face lit up, and he, I shook his hand, and he was happy to hear those words and I went back and sat down and I sold I told my son and the two workers there I said you want to talk about a real hero it's not some guy that can throw a football that's running around a pair of tights you've just spent the last 10 minutes going through all the stats and they're all taken back you know I tend to have that effect on people <laughs> <laughs> my wife wasn't there to say, hey, stop. Let them enjoy their meal. And I really played it up, make them feel guilty. What are you talking about? I said, there's a real hero sitting right over there. I said, you want, you want, you want to learn about a real hero? That man right there is why we have the freedom to do what we do here that man over there is why we don't have to meet underground to do church freedom we have in our country what is that that's putting things into perspective what is that that's realizing a commitment that a man made what is that that is bringing to light in a rather convicting way that our hearts are occupied with other things, and those other things are lawful. Those other things aren't sinful. But when those other things occupy all the drawers in our heart, that's when we are brought under the power of, of them. And that's when we lose commitment to the things that are most important. And I really believe this is what Jesus is trying to point out to them. 
The problem with man, verse number 17, the Bible says, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come for all things are now ready. The problem with man is that he is self-satisfied. And instead of hungering and thirsting after righteousness, he has something to do. And he has somewhere to go. And that's something to do and somewhere to go isn't sinful. It's just his thirst after righteousness is no longer there because he's got somewhere to go. May God help us to prioritize where our commitments are. Say to them that were bidden, come, go and tell somebody we have the unsearchable riches of Christ. When? When are we going to go? A certain man made a great supper and bade, bade many and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come, for all things are now, now ready. Now is the time. Stop worrying about the future. Stop making, stop stating Christian facts that we all agree with. What are we going to do now? What are we going to commit to now? And I would say to you that the problem with most American Christians isn't choosing between sin and service. It's choosing between service and service. Who are you going to serve first? All the drawers that occupy your heart or Christ first? I'm too busy. I can't go. The she shed and the man cave keep us back. The sports games keep us back. Work keep us back. All of those things may be necessary things. But I am submitting to you this morning, we are committed to them. And I'm asking us all to think about our commitments and the priorities to them. What is more important? I am not submitting to you one at the at the exclusion of the others. I am asking you to put all the others in the basement and have Jesus Christ and his service as the top committed priority. That's what I'm asking all of us to do. Is it always the sports game versus the outreach? Well, there's too many outreaches. I can't make them all. I don't want you to make them all. Because if you do, I would tell you don't make them all. <laughs> you got other priorities. Like throwing the football with your kid. Like spending some time with your husband. You can't have the ladies of Pilgrim Baptist running around town doing outreach all week. And vice versa. You can't have the men of the church spending all their out. Work is important. Family is important. All those things need to get done. Is it always family time versus church family time? I can't make any of the fellowships. I have my family. Okay, well, what about your church family? Yeah, I don't care about you all. We make all the fellowships. There's food being served. This is the fellowship. There's a ball game. If there's something, a little, little fun thing we're doing, you're, we're always there. But what about family time? Well, yeah, I really don't care about them. I just, like, you see how overcommitment on one side can ruin the whole meal? <laughs> We've got to be able to balance. What I'm asking you this morning is, right now, right now, what are we going to do? What are we going to commit to? Turn to 1 Corinthians 6. Because a lot of the attractions of our heart are not sinful. It's just when we overcommit to them, we get ourselves into a problem. And the mark of a good church that would turn into a great local New Testament church is commitment. We have to have our hearts prepared and committed to the right things and putting first things first. And we have filled the place of enjoyment, the enjoyment of being with God's people and serving with God's people in the house of God. We've filled that to commit to other things. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 12. All things are lawful unto me. But all things are not expedient. See, our problem isn't sin versus service. It's service versus service. We've taken all the things that are lawful and we serve them first. See, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Sometimes we're so convicted about not being converted to the world. 
we're so convicted about we're just not going to be worldly that we end up filling our hearts with things that are lawful and not worldly, but it's become first priority. Our commitments have become about those little compartments tucked away in our heart. Those things that we do that aren't sinful, but result in an appetite that doesn't hunger after righteousness. It just hungers after things that aren't sinful, that are lawful. And if we're not careful, our commitments can quickly become, it can quickly result in us not hungering after fellowshipping with God's people. And here's, here's where it is. Being emotionally committed to the work that the Lord's doing here. Are we a team? Are we a church family? We should be emotionally invested, spiritually committed to each other's health and each other's growth. But if our hearts are always occupied with other lawful things, how is that going to happen? It's not. It's not. Okay, now it's going to get a little rough. Luke 14, verse 18. Luke 14, verse 18. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excuse. Your heart can't enjoy Christ and fellowship with Christ's people because your farm's your idol. Your land's your idol. Your wealth's your idol. Told my wife, we've had this conversation before. We bought 15 acres. 1,200 foot from off the road. You can't get to our place unless you know we live there. If there's an unrecognized car coming down the driveway, it's go get the rifle. There's no reason for someone to be here. We're out there on purpose. <laughs> but not preparing for the tribulation or anything, just the... the <laughs> The nutsos that are out in the world, that's all. <laughs> but if my land becomes an idol, guess what's got to go? The land. The farm. Well, bless God, we don't go to the bar. Bless God, we don't listen to rock and roll. Bless God, we don't go to the Hollywood movies. Bless God, we don't spend thousands of dollars on worldly trinkets and pursuits. Bless God, we're as spiritual as we can be, except we're not. If we have something else, then we can't say, bless God, I'm not. You picking up what I'm putting down? Whatever it is that takes first place in your heart, we just look at, at we look at the world, we compare ourselves to the world, and we say we're one notch better, yet we're not one notch better. Because we've made a commitment to something else and we want an excuse. Well, I can't do this now, Lord, because I have this. And after all, it is lawful. And after all, it is spiritual. We got to be careful of those things. Look at the next verse. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excuse. Man, there's some honest cattlemen, especially around here. And you're not careful. Your cattle will keep you back. Your yoke of oxen will keep you back. You're blameless in all your business deals. You're committed to it. You see what the Lord's trying to teach us here? There are some things that aren't wrong. Where is our heart truly committed to? Let us not take for granted what we have here. Let us not take for granted each other. For a good church to turn into a great church, we need to be committed to the now. We need to be committed to each other. Not up everybody's business all the time. Everybody needs their space. We need to be careful of occupying our hearts with all of these other things that are lawful. But they just take up our efforts of commitment. Look at verse 20. Here's the third. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. You know what the accepted idolatry of American Christianity is today? 
the family. That's the accepted idolatry. Christ didn't have to warn his people so much, his people now, his people, so much about going out and sinning all weekend. Did anybody spend the weekend in Nashville on the side of the some back alleyway with a beer bottle in one hand and drugs in the other? I said, Brooks, that's ridiculous. What are you talking about? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. None of us are doing that. Christ never had to convince his followers to not be sin soaked. You know what he had to convince them? Go to Matthew 10. I'm telling you, this idolatry of family is keeping a lot of people back. Matthew chapter 10, verse number 37. I've not seen it once. I've seen it a hundred times through being in church, through uh, going through Bible school. And, and, and all. I've seen it so many times. It's just the same, the same thing. Family is the idol. Verse 37. Sorry. Matthew 10, verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's the warning. Moms and dads, I'm not telling you your family's not important. Well, God created that first. Stop it with that. Stop it. He told us, he told us in this verse you can't assume because that was created first. That's the most important. He told us, if you love your mom and dad, and if you love your son and daughter more than me, you have an idol. More than anybody on this earth, I love my wife. More than anybody on this earth besides my wife, I love my kids. But I don't love them more than Christ and my wife. If there's one person on this earth that she loves, that'd be me. But she don't love me more than Christ. And besides a woman's husband, there isn't anything she cherishes more on this earth than her youngs. There ain't nothing. But she won't cherish him more than she cherishes the, reg the, the, the relationship that she has with her Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not bad thinking. That's right thinking. Because if you love Christ and are committed to him, you will love your spouse so much better. And you will love your children and cherish your children so much better. Because it will be balanced out with where your true commitment is. Well, I'm just going to focus on my family. Okay, but don't not focus on Christ as you focus on your family. And you know what we do? We just make it spiritual like we were talking about earlier. And that's what Jesus has to deal with. People make spiritual facts. They say spiritual facts. But it's off the topic of what Christ is trying to point out to them. That's what he has to warn them. He has to warn them about, against the idolatry of the family. You don't have to turn there. But in Luke 14, it says, if any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Notice that he includes in there his own life also, lest someone would say, well, that's kind of mean. Why would you hate your... Jesus isn't telling you to go home, kids, and tell your parents you hate them because Jesus said... And he's not telling us as husbands and wives to use that language. He's trying to point out to us, your love for him should be so full of commitment. And there's such a vast difference between how much you love him that I'm willing to separate from my family if they ask me to not follow Christ emotionally, my emotions are connected to Christ. Who else thinks that's a tough verse? Now, that'd be easy to use if you're in a fight with one of your family members. <laughs> yeah, I hate you. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's trying to point out, how much do you really love me? Someone is called to be committed to Christ in a foreign country. You know what that means? They're going to have to leave their mother and father because they're committed to Christ. a tough verse it's a tough verse who are you committed to first is it jesus christ young people if you grow up and your parents decide to walk away from church and not read their bible and not be a committed christian are you going to go what mom and dad are doing or are you still going to read your bible and try to get yourself as an adult in the church that's a tough question you don't tell your parents oh i hate you no you love christ so much that if they're going to go one way you're going to go the other way you're sticking with the lord jesus christ where's your commitment at 
Where's your commitment at? What's a wife to do? What's a wife to do if her husband decides, you know what? I don't want to be a, a church attender anymore. I don't want to be committed to the work of a local church. I don't want to. Matter of fact, I don't even want to go to church anymore. What's a wife supposed to do? When he tells her, I don't want you doing it either. I'm asking. I'm not telling. But I'm talking about commitment. I'm talking about commitment. You know how easy it would be for me to get my mind off on other things? All of the hurt. All of the pain. All of the. Man, I thought. I thought that person was committed. I thought that person. I thought that. I mean, I thought. I thought. I thought. I thought. That's my problem. I got to quit, th quit thinking. Get my affection set on heavenly things. Have you ever been there? All right, let's wrap up. 21, Luke 14, 21. Sorry about that. So the servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, go quickly out into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And you see, you, 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 they've insulted the Lord. They're talking about their own gratifications. And he brings them back to the moment he wants them to be into. He mentioned it earlier. They brought up something else, and he brings it right back to what he was talking about. People wonder why God's angry. We're, we're, we're rich with mercy, God's mercy, God's grace, yet we won't go out for the, uh, for the uh, maimed, the halt, and the blind. And there isn't much time. That's why he says in verse 21, go out quickly, go out quickly. And streets and lanes of the city. Well, I'm not going to Nashville. I'm not going to Philadelphia. I'm not going to New York City. I'm staying out of Baltimore and Dallas-Fort Worth. You know why we say those things? Because all the junk that's there. <laughs> they need to hear the gospel. I'm trying to bring in this idea of what is it? What is it? The poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind, sick, the ones that need a savior. Can I say to you this morning? It has been, and I pray that you are committed. I want you to be committed. I want you to pray. If you're not, I want you to pray about being committed to going out into our city here and trying to get the gospel out to the lost. That is, that's a commitment. If we want to have these other things grow out of this local church, we need those that are committed to go into the cities, our little city, our little Jerusalem. Verse 22, and the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. Man, little Billy comes up. Hey, you got room for me on the team? Yeah, sure. Come on, Billy. You know, Billy's glasses are so thick, he can't see. He's got two left feet. He can't hold the bat correctly. and Trips over his feet when he tries to run the first play base. You got room for me? Yeah, come on, Billy. We got room for you. We got room for you. Our hearts have that type of commitment. I hope it does towards the lost. The Lord, he's there with mercy. And with him is plenteous redemption. Last verse. And the Lord said unto the servant, go out the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. My house may be filled. You've had a coach compel you. If any of you have been through the military, you've had a drill sergeant compel you. Take that same thinking. Apply it spiritually. Compel. Go out into the highways and hedges and compel. We compel our children to excel in academics and in sports and in music and all of these things, compel them to be committed to local church service, their local church family, their Lord and their Savior. Why? That my house may be filled. The only provision made for defeat is through in our own human minds. The Lord made no provision for defeat at all. He said, go out, my house may be filled. No assumption of failure on the Lord's part. Only on our part. The Lord wants everyone to enjoy the feast. And although we might be able to serve, we're not going to be able to serve everybody. We can still go out into the highways and hedges and compel them. There's no assumption or planned failure of defeat in the Lord's mind. It's only in our mind we draw back on our commitment. We have four years going in now, obviously, to five years. Let's stay committed. If there's anything in any of our hearts that has some storage that needs to get deleted or put off in an external hard drive, a second place, can we do that this morning? And can we just get recharged on where our commitments are? 